Okay. Look. This is the disclaimer on this video. I had a concept with this video, but to me, it wasn't working. But I don't want to waste the video. So, I've changed a few things and let's see where it goes. It's a bit all over the place. How important is family? Well, no man is an island. And when I say family, I'm not going to the obvious blood related example. I'm just going with the example of people you familiarize yourself with. Then after you can break it down to blood related or whatever construct, foster families, etc, etc. Like people say that Dean White is not Dillian White's brother. But them two say they are brothers. Which should be enough of an explanation for everybody. Nobody should have to delve further. If they say they're brothers, they are brothers. <laughs> you don't get to make up the laws how any family is structured. If they say they're brothers, they're brothers. I mean, none of their family members have came out disputing it. So why would you be? Surely they know more than you. I remember around 2002, I always used to watch Robert Kilroy Silk before I went to work. He had a chat show program. Now, I didn't often agree with Robert, but I always used to listen. He kind of wanted him to draw you in. So I'm watching the show, and he was breaking down his family unit. So there was a party, family party, and he had his grandson with him. So as people were turning up, his grandson was kept asking him, Who's that? Oh, that's your uncle. Oh, that's your cousin. That's your this, that. That's your that, this. And he was telling him, their names, and he was breaking down their jobs, what they did, their characters, and stuff like that. And he said, why that's important is because it instantly gives the kid purpose. It integrates the kid into a system where he knows if he wants something, he's got to work hard. If he wants to be good at something, he's got to work hard. He's got to be reliable. He's got role models. He's got standards to uphold because that's what he's born into. He's not going to want to let a lot of them family members down. He can spot troubled kids because of how they talk, because of how they act, because that's not done in his family. And if he hangs around with these kids, he knows it's going to take him off the path that he should be walking. It gives the kids stability, security. Kids like that know if they really want to push and become something, they'll have the support. They'll get good advice, lots of encouragement. I'm not going to go too deep into the stories, but growing up, I saw some parents absolutely destroy any confidence their kids could have possibly had. I've had my experiences with that. It's kind of depressing. You know, like, there's parts of the UK where there's generations of families who barely have anyone working. There's communities around Britain where the young people have no jobs in the area. They don't know anybody in their immediate family who's ever owned a business. There used to be this stereotype in a lot of communities in Britain that certain girls would get pregnant just so they could get a flat. And the f***ed up thing was, in some cases this was true. I know this, but it's not a thing where you can just say, oh, these women, they're scheming. A lot of times, they're boyfriends, and sometimes they're considerably elder boyfriends. That's just how it was growing up, you know. These are things that people don't like talking about <laughs> that, that was going on. Coerced them into getting the flats, impregnated them to get the flats. Generations of people going to jail or just having very negative, non-productive lives. And these kids are institutionalized into that. So it can go both ways. The school I went to was so non-productive. It was a good thing they didn't have Ofsted back then. That by the time I would have been in the fifth form, perhaps, I stopped going to school by the fifth form. They closed the school down. I'm just going to tell you it as it is. I know some people don't like that. They they think that I'm trying to maybe get them or but I'm not. I'm just telling telling it as it was. From the seventies to the eighties they closed the school down. From what I hear, 
that the school was just underperforming, the teachers were underperforming, and it was just a bad school. And I lived in a predominantly black West Indian community. And no disrespect to my parents, they did the best they could. But they weren't asking me where the parents' evening was, or they couldn't really take a particular interest in my schoolwork because their education coming from the West Indies was very basic. You see, if the kids in an area like where I grew up can't see no examples where education actually produces results, like you took all your O levels, see how old I am, or GCSEs, and now you've got houses and nice things, then they're not going to take any interest in the curriculum. So a lot of the kids who I grew up with, you know, they wanted to be footballers. Some accepted their fate that they're just going to go into menial labor. And way too many knew they were just going to end up in the streets. There was maybe a couple of kids who was thinking about university after school, but not many. And when I say a couple, I mean literally two, if that. So like I say... Family, the way I'm using it here, is not necessarily the blood relative example. And we have some very good teachers. Now, I'm not talking academically so much. But they sussed out where they were teaching, what area they were teaching in. And they saw that a lot of the kids are broken. And they talk to us, you know, on break time, they to talk to the teachers and stuff. Not all the time, but, you know, we'd have conversations very practical information about budgeting money working relationships because a lot of young people don't realize like impregnating girls that you didn't plan to stay with long term and going girl to girl it takes up a lot of time and a lot of mental energy that could be used way more constructively in terms of work career and just how you socialize if you're a young person, sometimes you don't realize you're spending a lot of time with people who are not going to take you to that place in life where you know you should be, or at least attempting to get to. But they're just there. And these are your friends. No, they're not so much your friends. They were there from school. You grew up in the same area as them. So you have an association. But your peer groups are going to shrink. They're going to shrink and shrink and shrink as you get older. When I stopped smoking weed, my peer group changed a whole lot. I realized there were some people who I would spend time with because that's all we had in common. It was the weed. Or you might start hanging with the people who are in your football team. You're bonded by that. But that doesn't mean you have common interests apart from the football. They might not share the same values that you have. But then again, a lot of young people, because there's more interesting things to do, they don't sit down to check what are their core values. They will find out what their core values, not through their parents, because who really wants to listen to their parents like that? You will find out by the actions of your peers what your core values are. If you see them do some really stupid shit and you're still rolling with them, is an indicator of what your values are. That doesn't mean you can't change. That could be a problem, because this is now what you're becoming familiar with. So, are they now your family? When your mum asks where you're going, you're going to hang out with your crew. And she says, I don't want you to go out with them guys. Mum, stop complaining, stop moaning, because you have to be there. You don't want to miss none of the action. Could be a dad as well. Now you're overriding your parents' authority. Now, this is always going to happen. It's the natural order. But... You want to override their authority on things like career choice, what college you're thinking of going, perhaps if they don't like the music you're listening to or the clothes you're wearing. You want to be at odds with your parents on them things, not whether you're going to be terrorizing your neighborhood or putting your life in potential danger. Young people don't ask the hard questions about who's a friend and who's an associate because there's more interesting things to do when you're young than getting deep and analytical and questioning everything like you've got your crew and 
you don't really like him, but he might have the car. He might have the access to the good you, to the good women, to the good clubs, but you don't like him per se, but he has his uses. You might be in a relationship just for the sex, but the stuff you have to put up with just to get to the sex is something you're going to have to weigh up if it's worth it or not. Now, when you're young and you're a dude, it's always worth it until you impregnate her or catch a dose. When you're young, some of your friends want to be cool and popular amongst everybody who's supposed to be hip. Some of us, it's just nice to belong somewhere in some peer group of some kind. Of course it is. The kids you see are recluses. They're normally very unhappy, a little disturbed. And then there are some who just like their own company and can't be bothered with it all. You know, I know a lot of kids growing up who everyone thought, ah, he's probably a bit weird. Next thing you know, they're hooked up, living with a girl, got kids, and working and just getting on with it. They just didn't want to get into the peer group because it's very competitive at times. It's very drama filled even if you're not bad kids doing crime into violence it can be very drama filled but there are some kids who don't need the validation or approval from their peer group there are a lot of kids like that they're not weird they just don't need it there was one white kid one of the few white kids in our school i don't remember what his name is i remember he was a good athlete i remember that and he was quiet as anything man and then we get to find out that in Breed Up a Gal when he was about 12 or 13. I said, what, him? Yeah, 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 Breed Up a Gal. Young, 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 like big shite. What, what the fuck? How'd that happen? <laughs> he was in the rugby team. Another one of the white kids in our school, a big dude. You know, he was a prefect, a good student. But he weren't a pussy. <laughs> he was a big dude, a big chubby goo. He weren't no pussy, but he was in the rugby team. And them two knew the rules of rugby. Most of us, because the rest of the team is black. We didn't know the rules. I remember one time we played at school. <laughs> one, of our, one of our, I know his name, I ain't going to say his name. <laughs> he done this rugby tackle on the guy's upper body and you can't do it. And you can't tackle on the upper body. I can't remember the rules, but you're not allowed to tackle the upper body. And it was just like, what the fuck is that? And more to the point, why did our school even have a rugby team? Because, not being funny, back then, it was, it was like, black guys didn't really play rugby. You had Martin O'Fire and Ellery Hanley, them two, but black guys didn't play rugby. I don't know why we even had a rugby team, you know what I mean? Seriously. We were shit. We didn't know the rules. And I guess because I'm in the football team, the PE teacher must think I want to be in all the teams. I didn't go for no rugby trials. And I remember, yeah, you're in the rugby team. How am I in the rugby team and I ain't go for the trials? Yeah, see my name there in the team? I'm in the rugby team. Didn't go for no trials. Didn't ask to be in it. Got up to the PE teacher. Sir, I didn't ask to be in the rugby team. I didn't go in the trials. Oh, you should be proud to represent your school. <laughs> We didn't have many games, actually. I don't think we was in a league. I remember I played twice. No, 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 I mean, no, 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 no. They tried to do the same thing with me in a cricket team. No, 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 not in, not in a cricket team. I remember one time, <laughs> school played cricket. <laughs> so I was watching it after. And one dude from our school, he's a fast bowler. Good footballer, he's good at all sports. And he's, he's a fast bowler. And he let go of his bowl, yeah? And it bounced off the green and it cracked. Must have been in the guy's orbital bone, actually. Nothing. My man's eye was swell up, boy. I was like, whoa. Yeah. That ball ain't no joke. I'm sure they had to abandon the game so he could get medical attention. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> and I didn't play in the basketball team. No way. I mean, I just didn't know what I was doing. It was just, I was just not coordinated to play basketball. I actually met. Ellery Hanley and Martin Alfire in this club up Yorkshire. Because, you know, when we was young, man, we, we, we done a whole load of clubbing all around the country, man. I'm glad we didn't have the internet. But yeah, anyway. So I said, yo, cool, man. Yo, Ellery Hanley and Martin Alfire shook Ellery Hanley's hand. 
went to put my hand out to shake Martin O'Fire's hand. The man was looking at me like I was dirt or he's going to lay me out or something. I said, fucking hell, bro. You know what I mean? Your man got some issues, bro. Kids are very territorial with their cliques. They don't even realize it. There's a hierarchy there. I remember one circle. Because <laughs> I had a few circles. One circle I used to be in. One of our brethren's good dude. <laughs> he was always in charge of the music. If we're around his house or around mine, he'll bring music. I remember one of my other brethren started to bring music. <laughs> Listen, he weren't happy about it at all. And I sussed it from the jump. <laughs> he could say, yo, 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 there's only one DJ in here. This ain't going to go down too well. This ain't going to go down too well. Because he DJs. It's not his one job, but he, he's a DJ. You know, even back then, he had his decks all set up. Nice set up. And he did it all himself. He's played out in clubs. He's done radio. And he wants you to sit down and listen to him fling down tunes. We're all talking. He's normally up on the thing, talking to us. He's blending music. And if he comes round mine or my other boys, he'll bring a whole load of tapes of his mixes, a couple of vinyls. And then my other brethren come start bring music. <laughs> and it's not like he just sort of like bought a tune, a new tune. No, no, he's trying to... He wants to be the music man too. Didn't go down well at all. <laughs> and then when girls get in the circle... They change the whole vibe of the circle. Some dudes remain who they are, but others start acting up a little. Yeah. Fights break out, man snapping on each other. I remember one time, someone acted out a character. And a fight broke out. I'm trying to look like a big man in front of these girls. And every time he saw this guy, he fought him. He jumped him. And it wasn't until one of my peers, elder brother... A rasta, a quiet rasta, very calm temperament. He said, man, you keep jumping him and beating him up like that. One day he's going to kill you. He's going to kill you. And he stopped doing it from that day. See how some of you guys talk about NFL and NBA? Well, football over here is met with the same enthusiasm. Football for young kids over here is everything. Like you develop a strong bond with your school football team your teammates you do it's an honour out of all them kids in your year you get selected to play for your team it's an honour gives you a great sense of purpose your teammate gets into a fight on the pitch and you run up you run up there yo yo you want something you want something you know because <laughs> that's your boy that's your teammate yeah I, I know we got into it with some schools. I didn't get involved, but I know um, I, I, the story's quite horrible because it involves females from the other schools as well. So I don't want to rehash that. <laughs> but listen, like not being funny, man, our school was just like, we just had wrong people. Just just nut, nutters, utter nutters in our school. Like our lower school was in Lordship Lane and our upper school was in White Hart Lane. So... Lower school was quite terrifying leaving junior school to go there. That was terrifying enough. Get to the third year, then fifth year kids. <laughs> Some scary kids, let me tell you that. Now, I remember one time we was having assembly. So, Mr. Jarman, blah, 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 rabbit in on, blah, 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 blah. Then all we hear from up the top balcony, Jarman, your blood clot. You scream like, I'm not going to say the kid's name. He still scares me up to now. He's probably old now, but fuck that. <laughs> he was, he was, he, 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 this kid was fucking horrific. He was horrific. I remember he got into a fight with this kid. And this kid was in the same year. And he was built like a truck, this kid. But he was a perfect student. He weren't no fighter. But he, he just had this physique. And I remember this dude fought him, bruh. And he took his head, man. He just cracked it in the little glass in the door in a classroom, bro. Fight was over. The other dude was crying. Big muscular dude just crying. I remember muscular dude's name now. He was a prefect. Now, I don't know if they have prefect in comprehensive schools these days. It's basically they select these kids. It's so long ago now. I can't remember. They, the prefects used to kind of like, they were supposed to sort of keep order or be role models of how to act as students you know 
you had to have good grades to be a prefect and be in favour with the teachers and whatnot. Something happened between him and dude. Trust me, I'm only telling you the light version of school life. We had a bit of a reputation when it came to football, you know. We stood out because we had them Argentina stripes as our kit. Light blue and white stripes. We stood out. It's weird, man. In the first and second year, I went to all the trials and I was used mainly as a substitute and I got in the B team, but I couldn't hold down a position in the A team. And then in the second year, I broke my leg at the sports center playing football. And when I came back, I went for trials at the end of the second year and I got in the team and I never missed a game after that. Weird. Like sometimes you'll be walking in the ends and some kid you don't even know will spot you. Oh, you play for that school, innit? Well, you hear them talking about you. Yo, he plays for that school. Yeah, yeah, he's right back for that school. It makes you feel like somebody. Girls here, you're a good footballer. That's always a good icebreaker. Normally they don't know shit about football, but you must be quite a popular boy if you're in a team, innit? So you can get with this, so you can get with that. Now, there was about... Let me see. Yeah, I'll name the schools. I don't give a shit. Somerset, our school, Tottenham County, Northumberland Park, William Foster, Drayton, High Cross. It's a girls' school. They're the main Tottenham schools back in the 80s. Some have been renamed and some have been closed down. Can't forget John Loughborough. Everyone forgets John Loughborough. That was a newly created school around 1980-1981 for troubled kids. For kids who, I don't know if they had learning difficulties or just, or whatever. And they used to have a red uniform, we used to call them Redders. And it was an all-black school. John Loughborough, it was an all-black school. But some kids were transferred from our school to Redders. A couple of kids. Just gone to Wikipedia. That's right, it was a Christian school. They're saying a voluntary aided school in Tottenham. It was operated by the Seventh Day Adventist Church. The school was named after John Norton Loughborough, an early Seventh Day Adventist. The school was opened in April 1980, yeah, 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 as an independent school. It joined the state system as a grant maintained school in 1998 converting to voluntary aided status in the following year. It closed in 2013. In 2013? I thought it closed before that, man. But Haringey Council, they closed the school. Reasons, low pupil attainment and a decline in pupil numbers at the school. After the school appealed the decision, the closure was confirmed and pupils left the school for the last time at the end of 2013 summer term. Maybe I've got that wrong that it was for troubled kids. Maybe there's something my brain is processing that's not true. Not sure. I wonder why they made it at all black school. I'm reading some articles. I'm really interested now. Just took it for granted back in the day. Because like I said, when you're young, you got other things on your mind, man. You know, study shit. It's just an all-black school, so what? It's an all-black area. The school was founded by a small group of parents in 1980 with the best intentions to give black children a well-rounded education in a supportive environment. See? You see what I'm saying? Our schools, see all them schools I mentioned before? They were all failing horribly, badly. Some of the schools, there was prostitution. One of the schools in particular, there was prostitution on the premises, apparently. And the violence, oh God, Jesus Christ. And we was an all-boys school. Our school was just, just ridiculously violent, man. Not a safe environment to educate kids. I see some boys new to our school. And within days, they were out, gone, didn't come back, didn't return. I see that happen a few times. So they faced a five-year battle for survival. Holcomb Road, that's right, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I know exactly where. Tottenham, North London. This is the first black produced school in Britain. See, Tottenham, we got a lot of history. Bernie Grant is the first black MP 
from Tottenham, Bernie Grant. After the rap. <laughs> in 1985, he was supposed to come out and say something politically correct. He said the police got a bloody good hiding. Oh my God, that caused all types of dramas. It seems fitting that it was here in a community of activists that a black-led school would emerge as a solution to the disproportionate underachievement of black pupils. Within the bar of Haringey, John Loughborough School has always been known as the black school. Nah, nah, it was known as Redders. <laughs> Where the social and emotional needs of pupils of African and Caribbean heritage was were as paramount as the educational ones. For some, the school's fate was sealed as soon as it took the decision in 1998 to go from a fee-paying independent school to a grant-maintained state school, saying... The change meant the school would be funded directly by central government, but would have to answer to a governing body, not the local authority, Haringey Council. The following year, it successfully applied for voluntary aided status, which meant it would be partially funded by the local authority. The move opened the door to more scrutiny, less autonomy, and ultimately a clash of ideals with emphasis now on attainment rather than the school's traditionally holistic approach. At its first ever Ofsted inspection in 2002, things were positive, okay. <laughs> John Loughborough was making good progress under the leadership of head teacher Dr. Edwina McFarker, appointed in 2000 as the successor to Dr. Clinton Valley, who oversaw the school's transition. The Ofsted report noted with enthusiasm an important aspect of the school which fosters achievement is the way in which, through the spiritual provision, the school develops pupils with a sense of self-esteem and raises their aspirations. Looking back at it now and being able to use the internet and having the time right now in isolation to put it all together, I remember my mum talking to other mothers from junior school and some of the mothers would complain about how the teachers would be handling their kids and how the kids just felt they couldn't thrive in that environment with them teachers. I now see why John Loughborough was made. The Daily Telegraph are saying that Osted found that John Loughborough was the worst performing school in London. This is before it closed. And they're saying 300 of the pupils are mainly black. So there were other non-black students in there at one stage, not many. Listen, when it started, it was pure black. I recognized most of the kids on their way to school when I was on my way to school. And it was like New Zealand, bruh, all black. And because it was founded on the seven-day Adventist principles, they're saying less than half of the students were seven-day Adventists. You know what I mean? People don't go to church like that these days. Back in the day, man used to go to church. Enough boys and girls got dragged to church back in the day. That was common. Man had to go to church. I remember the 70s and 80s and a lot of them elder black Caribbeans around my parents' age were heavily into religion. Like my dad's into God and my mum reads the Bible and stuff like that. But we never had to go to church though. But other kids, oh, church. Church, bruh. Yes. And they hated it. But, you know, that's a time that's long gone by. I don't think parents try to force their kids into church like that no more. Maybe I'm out of touch, though. Yeah, you go into a Caribbean person's home back then, they had the that particular picture of Jesus on their wall. <laughs> Just like that. I remember we had that picture, but who didn't? So football violence on the terraces and hooliganism was a big part of the 80s. And the football club is just around the corner from my school. And before it was all season ticket, it was much better, man. Like the old Tottenham Stadium in the 80s. Like for youngsters, it was about a £2 entry fee and you just watched the game. £2. In the late 70s, it could have been even cheaper. Because the first time I went to a football game was around 1979. And it was dirt cheap if you was a kid. And even if you was an adult, it weren't that much. Sometimes you didn't have the two pound. 
So you wait until half time and they just let the gates open. You can just walk through and watch the second half. Yeah. <laughs> the reserve team would play the next week. You just walk in and you just watch that for free. Yeah. You just walk in and watch the reserve team play. If you had nothing else to do. You get to see pros playing football. Not the first team, but they're pros. Terraces, before the all-seated stadiums, is the best way to watch football. Sitting in seats cannot compare to standing up in the stands. It's just two different levels of entertainment and excitement. Especially home games, because that's your territory. When you go to the home game, to Tottenham, and it's just covered in blue and white flags and scarves and songs are sung in the stands and and when you're winning oh forget about it forget about it the other day i was on youtube and i was watching old football matches from the 80s and i buck up on the game where we beat wolves seven nil you know and i watched that game and i was just revisiting my childhood I was laughing, smiling. I felt like crying at times. Because <laughs> I was there. I was there. I was there. 7-0. Was it 7-1? No. Nah, it could have been 7-1. We buried them. Buried them. I remember Glenn Hoddle just played an absolute blinder that day. I haven't been to a football match for ages. That as you approach a stadium, you would see people meeting up, fans meeting up with other fans. And they are family. Trust me. That bond of supporting the same team, it's family. There's no way around it. I was a regular, you know. So after a time, I see some hardened white dudes that see me there. You are, right, mate? <laughs> and um, a few of the kids from our school. And it seemed to be our school in particular. They got involved in the fighting on the terraces. A couple of the black kids, a couple of the white kids, they got involved. A couple of the Greek kids, I remember. And it, it was crazy. It was crazy, man. I remember there was one Greek kid in the calf, just on the neighboring block. And he was a little skinny motherfucker. We used to call him Untold Raz. Untold Raz. Because he supported Arsenal. And he'd always be talking about how he went up to Arsenal and there was untold rounds and fighting like that. Like he was involved. This dude weren't doing no fighting, man. Untold rounds. Untold rounds weren't fighting nothing. <laughs> some of them away supporters weren't no joke. And Tottenham had some heated rivalries with some clubs. I remember Leeds. When we played Leeds, bro. Police had to escort us from the ground all the way deep. Into Church Street. Yeah. I remember some of the people I went with from my school. They got escorted to Church Street. So instead of they just walk all the way through to where the railway station is at White Hart Lane. Or double back down to Bruce Grove. They went back to the stadium for whatever. Not me bro. No, no, no. Let me head off. <laughs> I got escorted out of danger. I'm alright bro. I'm going in my yard. I'm going in my yard. Go eat some of my brothers cooking bro. I mean, I mean, I know where I'm going. I done watch the game. I paid to see the game. I'm going home. Leeds United, no. You you really don't want to be getting in no fights with support bases like that. And in King's Cross, I don't know why at King's Cross, there it seemed to be some meeting point where a lot of football fans would meet up. And it looks like, I don't know if they were taunting each other and sometimes there'd be fights. And some of the kids from my school used to go. And I'm thinking, you can't fight them grown men up there. They're big, hardened grown men. And like, I'm not going to say his name, but I can tell the story because he's dead now. He's dead. Like, one of them, one of the kids from my school, is like, a hot white kid, a hard dude. He became a kickboxer. Him got up there. And he got involved in something. Man headbutted him in his head and knocked him unconscious, knocked his teeth out. Yeah. Yeah. And there was some nutters, some psycho, them football fans, I'm telling you, some of you ain't experienced it, man. Some of them are frightening, bro. Frightening. Like, I know some Scottish people got angry with my channel when I told them my experience with Glasgow Rangers. I don't care if you were mad with the channel, you didn't go through what I went through. When I went to have my driving lesson, 
And I didn't realise Tottenham were playing Glasgow Rangers. It was a friendly game. It's not a league game. When I walk through Philip Lane to the high road, I'm seeing a whole load of football fans. I'm saying, oh, what's going on? Football match. I didn't even know. Because it, it was a morning kickoff as well. So now I'm thinking, if I have to go all the way back up Beaconsfield to get to the driving school, I'm going to be late and miss my lesson. So I'm thinking, now I've got to walk down. I've told Doc about this. If Doc is listening, Doc's going to be laughing his head off. So I'm just trying to walk through and mind my own business. Get to my driving lesson. I see one mountain of a Scottishman in my face. You're fucking black this, you're black that, you're black this. So I ran into the road. <laughs> I ran into the road and his mate told him, Oi, stop, stop, don't, don't do that. What are you doing? And like his mate like told him to leave it. But I was on my toes now. I'd rather fight the traffic than them fans there. These these Scottish Glasgow Rangers fan. And I used to support Glasgow Rangers. They were my Scottish team. So I get further down the road. <laughs> and like, oh man. My driving school is just on the corner. And they've destroyed the off license. Destroyed it. <laughs> and listen, man. It's, it's no joke. People don't realize it's no fucking joke. Football hooliganism is real. I remember one of my friends, he went up King's Cross where they meet up. There's no game or nothing, but they just seem to meet up there. And I don't know if it just looks like a lot of posturing and fights go off. And he said that one of the, <laughs> one of the football hooligans, I think he might be the Scottish guy again. Right? <laughs> he must have stepped to one of um, my schoolmates. I can't remember who it was. And the Scottish guy is looking at whoever from my school and he goes... So you're the hardman, are you? You're the hardman. <laughs> My guy had to get out of there. I can't remember. You had to get the fuck out of there. Because that man was going to throw down. So a headbutt or whatever it is. It's not a joke. The white kid from my school, who I told you, got knocked out by the headbutt. He was a thug. And he went to a party outside London. So he got into it with either the doorman or security in there. I think he was said in drugs they told him not to but he doesn't listen to anyone you can't tell him you can't tell this white guy anything you can't you can't and if he hasn't made his point that he doesn't want to listen he's just gonna fight that's just who he is he's gonna fight so apparently he was piecing up this security guy piecing him up and it's embarrassing because you know security guys have reputations they're supposed to be hard but he's getting pieced up i heard this guy came back I don't know what he used, but it must have been some serious weapons, a knife. They said, I won't say who they was, because a lot of London men went up there. That he just went into this frenzied attack. Just stabbing, hacking, 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 stabbing, stabbing, and hacking, and hacking. Dead. <laughs> 